This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Good evening and welcome to another exciting episode of Vast Wasteland. Could it be Bob Denver, Karen Valentine, Walt, the cast of Soap, Henry Winkler, Mr. Ed and Wilbur, Marty J. Wiley, Mark Schmidbauer, and in the center square, Wilbur Neal. All on the new... Tuesday at 6, Wednesday at 10, Thursday at 3. At Darren Pamela Ferdin. Um, oh, no, not another Burgess Meredith show. Um, edition of Vast Wasteland. It's another potpourri edition. And, well, I'm Wilbert Neal. I'm MJ Wiley. And today we're going to talk about, um, gee, what are we going to talk uh, about? We'll think of something. You'd never know by all the stuff out here. We're going to talk about, uh, the doctor. Theodore Geisel, better known to most of you as Dr. Seuss. Well, there were two doctors when we were growing up, right? Dr. Spock and Dr. Seuss. Well, yes, and Dr. Spock was the, was the pediatrician. Not that Maybe guy on Star Trek. That's Mr. Spock, but this is another thing, and we're just getting totally off the subject. So I'm before so we glad get, you cleared that before up, Before we though. get too far away, let's, let's talk about the important stuff here, the fact that we are on at least Wednesday at 10 and Thursday at 3, and then somewhere on Saturday. And if, if your cable isn't messed up and you have a yes, station you can on actually Saturday, see it. If you can, you can actually, actually see, see it, it it's, that's when it'll be on. And if you can't actually see it, you've got a number. <laughs> You can call. You can complain. I did. Vote early and often. Yes. And um, if you want to write us and ask us what the heck we're talking about, you'd write Box 15, 1411, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. And put Vast Wasteland at the top of there so they'll know what you're talking about. And <laughs> let's see. Otherwise, what else is there? Um, nothing. Okay. So I guess we'll just get right into the show here. And we'll talk about Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Take it away, MJ. Okay, Seuss was actually his middle name. Did you know that? Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, you know that now. This is trivia. Take Tell notes. Us more. Class, take notes. Seuss was his middle name, and it was his mother's maiden name. And even though I think that we maybe think that we're special because we like, like we were like the generation that grew up with these, actually. Actually, the man started writing and drawing in the 1920s. And some of his first stuff was for 
Dartmouth College's little humor magazine called the Jack-O-Lantern. And from there he went to write, they used to have these little humor magazines. And there was one called Judge, and he was spot, his work was spotted, and he did like cartoons and did essays and, and all of that stuff. And there was this stuff this bug stuff, like before we knew like pesticides were like bad or something. And there was this bug stuff called Flit. And the Flit people hired him to do their ads. And he did them for like 17 years. And he gave them their, what do you want to say, their little tagline, which was, Quick Henry, the Flit. Okay, first children's book. Which one was it? Which one was it? Come on, come on, come on. Which one was it? I have no idea. Yes! Cat in the Hat. Wrong. That's the one everybody thinks was the first one. The first one was actually to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. This was meaning the first, the first children's book that that. But he wasn't Theodore really Geisel writing did. children's books. He was actually writing a book for whatever audience. He did. He never targeted that as kids' book. And and. For, for, for whoever wants to know this information, it may come up on Jeopardy, so, you know. He conceived it as a nonsense verse while listening to the engine of a steamship he was on during a transatlantic trip. Okay. Now figure it. <laughs> he was just passing the time and decided to write a book. it was written in 1937. Okay. Well, the, the rhythm of the engine gave him the idea and... I wasn't there. I don't know. Okay. Well, I don't fine. know. I move, don't know. Move along. Move along. Move <laughs> along. <laughs> well, anyway, this is a book that some guy wrote, and it's, you know, if you want to read more about it and all that kind of thing, um, it's called, if you can read this, you're real good, The Tough Coughs As He Plows the Dough. It's a collection of early essays, and it's got some of the flit some of the flit ads in it how's that mark <laughs> ah! okay <laughs> and maybe you want to read what that says <laughs> well they're all just different flit ads and they just basically all say quick henry the flit <laughs> okay um a couple of cartoons and they were done for a humor magazine. Ooh, that's dark. Ooh, yeah, I can't see it on the monitor thing, but I've got glasses on. And let's see, just, just, just to make things more confusing. Uh, he, he was kind of also um, a contemporary of that guy that made those neat machines and things. You mean Rube Goldberg? That guy, that guy. <laughs> so, so, so the doctor kind of had some of his own little inventions like that. This one is a, a foolproof system for cheating at solitaire. Which it, it, it's, you know, just overly elaborate. I don't know if you can see it. I can't see it, but it's just overly elaborate and real crazy. And you can kind of see, why, why, doesn't that somewhat look like Horton the Elephant? My, he certainly had his style down, didn't he? <laughs> Shut up, I'll slap you. <laughs> anyway. Well, a lot of these, these early things, like, you know, they were the ancestors of the cat in the hat and, all, and um, Horton and, and everybody like that. And he just, he wrote little essays. He was like a real into the language. He was like a real amateur linguist. He studied language. Uh, one of my favorite little essays that he wrote is from the title of this book. It's um, The Tough Coughs as He Plows the Dough. And the subtitle is, or why I believe in simplified spelling. And just, I mean, if you ever get a chance to go to the library and get this book, this is like a good book. It gives you like background and history. He also did anti-fascist cartoons. Here's, here's something you didn't know. He wrote scripts for Frank Capra's Signal Corps unit in World War II. Wow. Oh, go home. <laughs> and he was awarded the Legion of Merit for that. He had three, three Oscar-winning films. I can think of one. No, you can't. Okay, what I can't is it? think of what one. What is it? The 5,000 Figures of Dr. Two. No! Elegant. 
No, he did not get anything for that. And if no one's ever seen that, the 5,000 fingers of Dr. Terwilliger. Or Dr. T. As or it's Dr. T. Is like, he wrote it and he designed the sets, but he was designing sets in Hollywood. And and he did toy designs and he wrote the he wrote uh, the, the three oscar winning films he he uh was involved with uh two of them were wartime documentaries hitler lives and design for death that doesn't really sound like dr seuss but and plus he did a script for one of the gerald mcboing boings which i can kind of remember but maybe you remember better well no actually i don't but i've heard a lot about them yeah basically about this kid who talked in sounds yeah. He never really said words. He just talked. He was kind of an onomatopoeia little guy. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Anyway, he <laughs> talked in sounds. <laughs> and and he did toy designs, and he won Emmys, and he won a Peabody, and he even won a Pulitzer Prize. A Peabody, you say? <laughs> Is a dog, yeah. No, it's a... Hello out there, sure. <laughs> anyway, um, perhaps we should clarify the fact that even though he is known as Dr. Seuss, he's not really a doctor. Well, he did get honorary degrees in, like, 56 and stuff. But this was long after he had started using the term Dr. Seuss, and he used that to kind of put it forth that he was um, a professional and he was trying to teach people things. Yeah. And then it just, people um, simplified the thing down. It's like, it's like when, when, I'll use this, it's like when comics were first done, they weren't done just for kids, they were done for everybody, but people just, um, over the years, said, oh, this is just kid stuff and it got relegated down to being children's things. The Dr. Seuss books weren't necessarily done for kids originally, they were done for everybody, but then people look, oh, this is just little simple things, so they just relegated them down to kids' things. And It's like um, nobody that's older than 10 or so wants to read anything and, and learn anything from something that looks like it's um, that's done in a comic style and it's done with cartoons, so. Yeah. It got to be just kids' books, but they're really quite informative. Well, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it's... I know these were some of the first books that I got because they still have the offer, but, you know, it's like, you know, you open the magazine and it was like, uh, you know, get 300 books for a dollar, <laughs> that kind of thing. And it kind of got you into a book club, and then they sent the Dr. Seuss books to your home and your parents shelled out the money so that you had a nice little set of, of books. And... Uh, Maybe that's why I read so many of them, because I was involved in that, and they still do that. Well, and I don't know, may, you know, I don't know if that was done before the 60s or not. Is that kind of a marketing thing was done? Well, it probably was, because before then there wasn't really, um, well, TV wasn't as prevalent as it is now, of course, and magazines were really, um, uh, the way a lot of people um, got information, magazines and newspapers, so I'm sure they had lots of ads and things in there for more things to read or something so maybe maybe but I know I had an awful lot of these books to still have them somewhere and, uh, and then of course these were a lot of the books that you would find when you went to the library and went to the children's department the Dr. Seuss books always seemed to be prominently displayed or um, they were just always there you could always find a Dr. Seuss book you felt good to go to the library and find a Dr. Seuss book and in fact kids still feel good to go to the library and find a Dr. Seuss book. And I think for us, though, it was like the the Vogue reading. I mean, I've heard stories about how the cat in the hat came about, and it was like basically he read what was being offered to kids to, to learn to read, the, the beginning reader's books, and he thought, these are boring. Give me the same vocabulary, and I can make an interesting story. And it kind of just, like, shot off from there and Cat in the Hat became like his logo and stuff but I think these were some of the first books that the stories like they had that message not obviously but like we probably didn't realize it but when you read the Sneetches you're learning about prejudice and racism but it doesn't hit you until you actually learn what those words are and like uh Oh, oh, Horton Hears a Who. Not the first time I heard it, but like when I heard it, and for anybody who hasn't like read it or they even did a, who did the cartoon? 
Oh, well, there were just a bunch of cartoons that were done based on the Dr. Seuss things. Um, but the Horton Chuck one was a Jones real old one. Chuck Jones was the, um, oh, okay, the before real then, there was, a, there was an older one, um, I think that was a Warner Brothers. Oh, okay, yeah, but that wasn't Horton Here's a Who, that was Horton Hatches the Egg. Okay. With the silly bird and everything. Yeah. And then Horton Here's a Who was later done. Well, Chuck Jones kind of got the thing to do a bunch of those, and he was still with... Warner Brothers, I guess, at the time, so they, everything kind of looked the same there for a long time, because um, Chuck Jones was pretty much kind of in charge of drawing them all, so, or directing them all or something, and everybody just kind of looked the same. The Grinch had this certain look about him, the Cat in the Hat had a certain look about him, and, and then it went, Tom and Jerry kind of had that <laughs> same look about him, and Bugs Bunny, even after a while, got that same look, because they were all being done by pretty much the same people. Yeah. yeah. But, but if, if you haven't ever heard Horton Hears a Who, Horton is this elephant here, and he, like, finds a clover, and he hears it talking, and everyone thinks he's crazy, but actually, on the clover, on a speck of dust, is an entire, well, it's the Who's, actually. Yeah. And he can hear them. And everyone, of course, thinks poor Horton is crazy and, and nuts and all that. And they try to destroy it. And so all the Who's unite on the dust speck and they scream so that they get heard. That story messed with my head when I was about nine years old because it made me start thinking, like, maybe I'm living on a dust speck somewhere. <laughs> Was I too deep or what? Well, see, it's, it's just kind of a thing of perspective because at the end of the story, the Doc Hoovy, a little dust speck falls and, and hits something that he hears it fall again. It's calling for help. And it's just, he's already living on a dust speck, well, what we would consider a dust speck. And here's a dust speck that he considers a dust speck, which would just be infinitesimally tiny to us. And it's just, it just kind of gives you the whole feeling that the the cosmos is just huge, and we're just <laughs> insignificant. But it's not just huge, huge, it's huge in a tiny way, too. Well, it's everything, for everything that's huge, or that you think is huge, or that you think is normal size, there's always something bigger, and there's always something smaller. And so, we are not alone. But didn't it, like, make <laughs> you think? Did, no, maybe it didn't make you think. <laughs> well, that, that's, there is my thought. That we're just not alone. There's, there's more out there that we know about that's either bigger than us or smaller than us, but we're just not alone. Yeah, I think that made me think. <laughs> <laughs> which one did you read? Or which one did you like? Which one do you remember best? Fox and Socks. <laughs> Why? Give us a selection. Because it's a lot of it's a lot of tongue twisters, and boy, were they fun. This is a hard book. I always enjoyed Fox and Sox. Of course, um, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. That's like one of the first ones that I really remember reading. I didn't really read the Cat in the Hats until much later. I'd always see them on there, but I never really read the Cat in the Hat books. And first, I read the Cat in the Hat comes back before I ever read the Cat in the Hat. But good for doing things backwards. I, I guess because I got them in order. So I got followed, you know, I got the cat in the hat, and then I got the cat in the hat came back. And all those beginning easy readers, these are the books that I learned to read on. These, I can read it all by myself. I can things. read it all by myself, yeah. Beginner books. Well, through three cheese trees. <laughs> three free fleas flew. <laughs> wow, these free fleas. <laughs> <laughs> Through three cheese trees, three free fleas flew. While these fleas flew, freezy breeze blew. Freezy breeze made these three cheese trees freeze. Freezy trees made these trees cheese freeze. That's what made these three free fleas sneeze. Yes, that's a fun one. I enjoy <laughs> these tongue twisters, whether I can really do them or not. That's and it's just one. full of little tongue twisters about different things in here and, and it's a, this fox and he just comes along. there's always seems to be some creature some person some entity that comes into another one's life or another one's existence 
that just totally messes up everything that they've ever thought about before, and they end up either liking or disliking whatever it is that the interloping entity does. It's like locally, I think we're having a revival of green <coughs> eggs and ham. Well, this uh, is true. With I've the Creole heard funk band, that. I've heard uh, does a little kind of a rap version of green eggs and ham, and so. Perhaps maybe we can even go back to Dr. Seuss and blame him for some of this rap stuff that's going on. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's so much that or that the idea that they are so easy, they're so prevalent, and they already rhyme, that it's just easy to do songs or things with them. But, I mean, you know, we already, we, we probably got the rhythm here from this, you know. And, you know, I see a nose on every, I see a nose on every face. I see noses every place. A nose between each pair of eyes. Noses, noses, every size. I think he taught us to talk like that. <laughs> I am Sam. Sam, I am. Do you, Do you like, like green eggs and, and ham? ham? <laughs> I learned how to cook those. <laughs> but actually, they're not bad. They're not bad. <laughs> Would you eat them in a house? <laughs> Would you eat them with a mouse? <laughs> Would you eat them here or there? <laughs> Would you eat them anywhere? <laughs> yeah. Would you, could you, with a fox? Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> as long as that fox ain't wearing socks in a box with knocks and chicks and clocks and chicks and socks. And it just goes on and on, and sometimes these stories seem to overlap on each other, or characters seem to reappear, and things like that. It's just, yeah, it's just it, fun and wacky. It didn't dawn on me for a long time that the Grinch was looking down on Whoville, and that Horton Hears a Who, and those people were Who's. And it was, I mean, I was grown before I made the connection that they were all who's. And it was like, ooh, and that made, that made the Horton thing even deeper. <laughs> yeah, I just wonder how that Grinch felt getting rocked around when the dust speck fell off or wherever it was. I wonder if it was before or after his miraculous growing of the heart. <laughs> Who knows? And we can a, only speculate. There's, a, there's even a cartoon where the cat in the hat meets the Grinch, and they go through this whole thing. And there's one about the Grinch and um, this little boy, because Halloween is Grinch night, and this little boy tries to keep the Grinch from getting to town, and it's just a fun little story. But the thing about those cartoons when they did them that this kind of uh -oh. got to me He's after a while flash. was that every time they needed a girl's voice on those cartoons. I always use that darn Pamela Verdon. That darn Pamela Verdon. Every time I turn around, her voice was it. That's just another thing. Darn Pamela Verdon. It's okay, baby. It's okay. It's okay. Pamela Verdon. <laughs> oh, Ferdy Verdon. <laughs> Pamela Verdon. <laughs> she loves you too, baby. <laughs> Pam, if you out there Ferdin. write him a letter, he's so frustrated. That <laughs> right, darn it. Let's, let's talk about here, to you too. We mentioned the, um, that 5,000 fingers of Dr. Twilliker. There's a little kid in there named Bart. He seems to like these kids named Bart because there's Bartholomew Cubbins and the 50 hats, uh, 500, 500 hats, and there's Bartholomew and the Oblek. And I, he just likes this kid, Bart. <laughs> <laughs> this kid always seems to reappear after a while. Well, Bartholomew is rather a... A melodious name. It comes off the tongue nice. No, I guess so. Do you think there's any connection with uh, Bartholomew J. Simpson? Ah. Ah. More possible Seuss influence in That's our daily right. life today. <laughs> That's that name, Bart. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like you're, you're barking, but you're saying a name. <laughs> it's like an animal sound that, that makes a statement. Bart. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought about that. Never thought, of, no. And I probably won't anymore. <laughs> and, and another thing that Dr. Seuss just loved to do, it seemed like, was he would make, um, well, he'd always had these just odd names for things, or he'd make up odd animals and well, make he, them do odd things, and it was, it was he, just he wild. He played with the language. He played with the language. He played with English. Well, that ambiance zebra, though, it's, it's, yeah. it's full of odd things. <laughs> Bizarre things, yeah. Because Ambient Zebra, is, it's like taking the alphabet and giving it 26 extra letters, and for each letter there's a there's an animal that describes it or something, or just it's just wild things, like it was just, just wild. It was wild. It was something. It was, something. It was wild. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I don't know, the Lorax, the Lorax. Now, we couldn't find the, the Lorax book, but there is a cartoon of the Lorax. Yes. 
Lorx was done. And uh, I think that was like one of the first uh, sort of aimed, it was aimed at everybody, but of course being because it was Dr. Seuss, it kind of got aimed at kids, but to make you environmentally aware. And I mean, that came out in like, what, the 70s? Well, the cartoon possibly did. The book was out, I'm sure, in the 60s. But, but I mean, you know, it's really like, there weren't that, the, that kind of information. Now, you know, kids get all these little golden books now and stuff that is like, you know, how to take care of your planet and, and things like this that are really aimed at kids. But back then, you know, it wasn't, kids literature didn't really have to make kids think about anything. It was just there to, you know, to, to entertain. It wasn't really, it was, he was like doing this, this make kids think kind of thing before we knew we were allowed to think. <laughs> And you thought you were just reading to read or reading to learn the language. He was actually throwing a little message in there, mm -hmm. which a lot of his stories actually did, which is a good thing about him, too. And it's, it's it was good. Slid him in there. Slid him and in still there. good. And, um, I mean, he's, he's even recently, well, just recently, meaning within the past 10 years, came out with a couple of other books. There's one, All the Places You'll Go, and then there's another one called The Butter Battle Book, which is really a good one, um, denouncing war or talking against fighting and everything. as a just a really good book, but unfortunately, well, the Dr. Seuss died like last year, couple, early, couple early, years ago or so. Well, early last year, or yeah, either 90 or 90, 92, 91 or 92. He, he just passed away, so I was very sad, man. But, um, because you don't think it's like it's like you don't think that that's going to ever happen. It's like when Jim Henson died, it's like, oh no, these are immortals, <laughs> these, these are. Immortal people, they're not people, they're immortals. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, I was like stunned and amazed. But uh, he wrote a book, he wrote a book in the 80s about aging. And he actually aimed it, what was it called? What was it called? Come on, you, you the one that knows the library. Well, I can't remember the name He's of it right now, it but anyway. He's gonna make me look it up. He wrote this book and it was about um, aging and having to go to the hospital. You're and all only that. old once, 1986. Okay. I've not read that because I'm like not old yet, so I'm saving <laughs> that one. It's like I had all these when I was a kid, when I was a kid and when I was young, I ha had all these and then it's like, this one came along, and this is like grown up. This is like all his early stuff, which he was when he was writing for adults and writing for for uh, humor magazines and stuff. So that one I have to save for when I decide I'm like ancient and old and stuff. And there's another one too <laughs> that he's got that's uh, some of his older things, and gosh, I can't think of the name of it right now. But it's a lot of his earlier cartoon work, also much like this one, but. It goes into a bit more history about his early stuff and image songs and But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Back at you guys. <laughs> it's cool. So, um. <laughs> so, <laughs> we gotta wrap this up. I guess so, eventually at least. Um, sort of, kind of. Sort of, kind of. Which one are you grabbing there? Well, this is all the things you can think. Because he just enjoyed doing things that, well, made you think. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> and there are quite a few books that are in these, um, these bright and early readers or beginning readers that I can read by myself that weren't necessarily just Dr. Seuss because the, uh, the Berenstains who do have the whole thing with the bears mm -hmm. and all, they were linked into this series. And um, there were things like, oh, um, Put me in the zoo, which wasn't really done by Dr. Seuss, but yet it was linked into this mm -hmm. into this group. And there's the the, book the, of the foot book, the nose book, the tooth book. They aren't really done by See, uh, the foot book. He was thinking of everybody, wasn't he? <laughs> well, there's other the ones nose there. book. <laughs> yeah, they were. They're like got. They've got the cat in the hat on them, but they were actually written by someone else. But the foot book was actually Dr. Seuss. That was his. Well, the nose book and the the tooth, tooth book. book. They just tried to do other ones on there that weren't really written by Dr. Seuss, yet they um, were illustrated by were him. Were illustrated and put into the same the same grouping, the same categories. Like once he got established, he invited in other authors and other people that had ideas to go ahead and do their books, and he'd mm -hmm. put them in with his, so that people would read them and and be exposed to these different people, which is which is kind of like what 
cool. Well, a lot of other people do, but it, it was it was cool. It was a good idea. So, um, boy, we'll miss him. <laughs> but we don't have to because we still got all the books. We still got the books so we can live on. We can live on in our memories and on and on and on forever. And, and what's hopefully next? Hopefully his messages will, will go on too and people won't forget the things that he tried to teach us, which were really good. Gee, we had such a resource and we didn't even know it. That's right. What's next time, Mark? Turner? Next time when we Turner do on your TV. <laughs> the Fast Wasteland thing, it'll be all three of us again and we'll be... Talking about the Ted Turner universe and all the things that he's done. And then after that, it'll be then another comic it, uh, book yeah. show. And then the next time us, the two of us are here, it's going to be something else altogether. <laughs> but we forget because we no, never we're going to be talking about <laughs> breakfast <doing> cereal. <laughs> Boy, will that be fun. We'll see you when we're talking about that one. Okay. Not until then. <laughs> we're getting all these signals. We'll see you next time. Hi! <laughs> Good evening and welcome to another exciting episode of Fast Wasteland.